All right, guys, we're going to get uh, right into it. So, Jeremy, before we started the, the podcast, we started talking. You were talking about the Roman Empire and Caesar and how the left is comparing Trump to Caesar, what, what's your what's your take on that? So I I think number one they're full of crap, and the reason I the, the reason I say that and the whole, I mean across the board yeah. the left is full of crap, but yeah. we can all agree to that. Well, they're they're trying to take infor- they're trying to take advantage of the fact that people don't know and people don't understand, and um, the thing I think is the major confusion for people about Rome is that it had, it had three eras in time, so it's founded in 753 as a kingdom. And so from 753 BC to 509, it's a kingdom. Mm-hmm. 509 BC to 31 BC is the Roman Republic. Mm-hmm. And then 31 BC to 476 AD is the empire. So what people don't consider is Caesar was a late Republic character. So they're trying to say, okay, that Trump is ending the American Republic. Now, a lot of people could disagree with me on this, but I think if you want to look at it, the American Republic ended more in like 1913. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is in the progressive era, particularly in 1913, you have the 17th Amendment that passes. Mm -hmm. So that means that state legislatures no longer vote for the Senate. So the Senate and the House actually do the exact same thing now. They don't serve a purpose. That would have done a lot in the 2020 election because um, the Senate would have had something to say about what happened, right? You also have income tax, which passes, and you have the Federal Reserve, which passes. So we have a lot of the same vestiges of a republic, but we don't actually have a functional republic. And that's actually very similar um, to Woodrow Wilson being more like your first emperor, who's Caesar Augustus, Caesar's adopted son, and then um, you know, kind of really creating this new thing. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, I don't think Trump is, is Caesar. I think we're more in what's called the crisis of the third century. So about 200 to 300 AD, Rome has major problems, which are the first is 15,000% inflation by, by 284. 15,000? 15, 15,000 by 284. We're complaining by what, what were we at, nine? Well, we and, were at nine yeah. when Biden took office, if you believe yeah, what he says. Yeah. 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 He they also have a massive immigration problem, and they have a central power problem. Those are three problems that we're dealing with now. Now, the thing we don't have is we don't have um, you know, governors and people raising an army and attacking each other. Mm-hmm. But not that yet, is one, anyway. Not, not yet, but yeah. we do have that inflation problem, we do have an immigration problem, and we have a central power problem, right? Mm-hmm. Our 10th Amendment should fix the central power problem, but the federal government isn't abiding by it. Mm-hmm. So if you want to look at it, that's where I put us on kind of the, the Rome map of things. Got you. So, uh, so here's my question, Jeremy, and then and kind of I want to go to you and uh, 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 Shane. When you, when you hear people saying, like, you know, the fall of, of, of Rome, Jeremy, and like the, at the height of where they were, I tell Rob this all the time, I go, I feel like we are the people that were in Rome, Jeremy, at the right when it was about to fall, and we're trying to warn people, like, hey, listen, all this, like, we're we're not doing well. In, like, the inflation is crazy. The people, the wars, the everything is going wrong right now. Do you feel like we are headed for that type of? Because I mean, we've been a superpower for ever. Like, are we? Are we due? I hate to even say it. Are we due to fall? So I think the thing you have to consider when you look at so 284, there's an emperor that comes to power named Diocletian. And he does some really good things. He also does some really terrible things. Mm-hmm. Um, when Rome wasn't doing well, the thing they would do is persecute Christians. So that's one of the things that Diocletian does. Um, it's things other emperors have done when things aren't going well. But the things he does that are positive is he does a big monetary reform. So he starts um, basically minting new coins. Mm-hmm. He does a he changes the way the army works because what happens in the second century is you have what are called the barrack emperors. Emperors realize that their power comes from the military, mm-hmm. so they would. A general would raise an army, pay that army a lot of money, attack the city of Rome, and declare themselves emperor. So in the third century, you have 47 different people claim to be emperor. And what happens is they debase the currency in order to keep doing that. That means clipping the pieces off of coins, adding other metals to coins, and that's how inflation becomes a problem. So when you get to like 284, when Diocletian becomes emperor, he mints a, a new silver coin, which helps to stabilize things. He also takes the military and splits it up. He puts half of it on the border to handle the immigration issues with the bar- barbarians on the, the borders. Mm-hmm. And then he brings half of it inside the empire to support the empire and keep from people raising the army and attacking Rome. Mm-hmm. So if you want to look at how does that work for us, number one, you can't have a country exist without borders, right? It's, it's killing us and it's also having people you know, take too much off of the welfare state. And I think that's why I think it's important to understand citizenship in Rome. Um, in 212 AD, Emperor Caracalla does what's called the Edict of Caracalla. He takes 30 million people that are in the Roman provinces and declares them citizens overnight. 
Whoa. So what that meant is they were citizens without the vote. So they couldn't vote for anything, but now they got social programs. And the bigger thing is the emperor could tax them, so he's able to get money. Sounds like us. Sounds, sounds, so like, familiar. sounds really yeah. familiar. <laughs> so That's really weird. It's what happens familiar. is you have the welfare state is, is basically destroying the Roman state as the currency is deflating. That's very similar to what we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. So unless we handle immigration, unless we get back to some sort of a standard currency, we're headed right down the same road. Now, those reforms that happened in 284... Rome does last till 476, but if you look at what's happening in America, you know, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes, right? So yes. I think, frankly, our timeline is a lot faster, and we do need to move fast and getting back to standard currency. What are you going to say, Shane? So do you think that there was ever a way for Rome to reverse course, or do you think civilizations just follow cycles and you can't negotiate with it? I think it could have reversed course because these reforms are done by Diocletian, after Diocletian, you have Constantine, um, who's the first emperor to not make Christianity the Roman religion. That doesn't happen until 370 under Theodosius. Um, but he's the first Christian emperor. And he actually continues a lot of these policies of, of Diocletian, of good monetary policy and things like that. After um, Constantine, the same policies continue of debasing currency, bad immigration issues. They don't learn a lesson. So I think that the, the issue is if they instituted these reforms and they continue to properly reform, you can actually preserve the Republic. Because you look at um, 476 is when the Western Roman Empire fell. But nobody talks ab about the Eastern Roman Empire, which we call Byzantium. They wouldn't have called themselves you know, Greeks or Byzantines or whatever. They would have called themselves Romans. And that lasts until uh, 1453 when the Ottomans invade Constantinople. So the one thing that they had going for it is geographically they're in good shape. And they also had the better tax base. Um, being Egypt and Palestine and a lot of those areas. Mm -hmm. So I think if with the right reforms, it could have been stabilized and it could have continued. But if you continue in the same path and the same bad management, you're headed in a terrible direction. What do you think, Connor? Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me, going back a couple months, we did a report uh, that I discussed on, on this show about how, I believe it was uh, Senator Dick Durbin yes, it was. Put, put forward a proposal to uh, conscript illegal immigrants into the military in exchange for citizenship. Rome did that. Yeah, and Rome th did. that was exactly the comparison I made. Of like, they recruited barbarian armies when they couldn't get their own people to enlist, and the barbarians eventually just kept raiding them instead of uh, actually going out to fight for them because they had overextended themselves. Well, and, and also too, like crisis. one of the issues you have as well is when you look at. Um, so the Roman army had like the standing Roman army, which you don't have in the late Republic. You do have in the early Empire. And they also had something called the Roman Auxiliary. So the Auxiliary were people that weren't citizens. And if you served for, in the beginning it's 20 years, later on it becomes 30 years, you could gain citizenship for yourself and for your family. So like you actually had to like work and buy in to get the thing, right? And I think, the, especially in 212, the issue you see is when people are getting citizenship and getting this thing and getting all the social programs, but they don't have to buy into the system. That's one of the major things that causes collapse because as the currency debases, as central power crumbles, well, the barbarians and the tribes like that didn't need the central power anymore. They just decided in 476, you have the, the barbarian king Odawaker, who had basically just had, was ruling behind the last emperor, Romulus Augustus, and he gives them a place to retire to, gives them some money and says, you know, we're not going to kill you. Go, go relax. And he declares himself king, and that's the, the empire is over. So eventually when they don't need the empire anymore... That, that's where you go. So those guys were basically, it would be like if we just took like Mexico and gave them a bunch of money to fight our wars for us. And then they were like, wait, we have all the power now. Why are we listening to these exactly. people in DC? Exactly Why don't we just start a new government? Exactly. And real, real quick, Jeremy, because we didn't get to, to touch on this. Yeah. But because uh, we, we knew this a little bit from talking to you beforehand. Uh, but the audience at home might not know. You're not just like some guy who showed up and decided to start talking about Rome. Like you actually have... A background in studying yeah. this, if I'm if I'm correct. Like, what what uh, what do you have studied, or what have you studied in, in this? So, uh, my undergrad degree is in uh, is in Catholic theology and Judaism. Why? Nice, nice. Then I uh, I studied literature at New College Oxford, and then I got my master's in uh, early Roman Empire propaganda. Um, this is way back in 2011. Wow. Nobody cared about what I did um, when I got out of school, so I ended up doing a whole bunch of different things before I started my company back in in 2016, and um, that whole why do men think about the Roman Empire thing pop up, popped up on TikTok. And my wife's like, you're suddenly relevant, honey. I'm like, I'm relevant? But thank you. I, I'm glad you yeah. love me. I'm waiting for and that to happen. She's like, I'll go get the laundry. Yeah, so 
people wanted to suddenly talk about it. And I think it's it's interesting because the thing I'm finding, and I don't know if, if you guys have seen this as well, nobody really knows about Rome. And what the information they do know is just propaganda that's used against them. And I think it's actually really useful information so we don't repeat the same mistakes. So you said you studied their propaganda. What what does that look like? So I looked, my, what, my study was mainly around um, the first century, first century BC, first century AD. So kind of like around that year zero time period. And I looked at, I don't use like BCE and, and CE, by the way. That's woke history. We yeah, don't do that's, that. That's yeah. crazy. Um, but the, what I looked at is the propaganda of Augustus, because Augustus is the first emperor. He's the adopted son of, of Julius Caesar, but he's the first guy to become emperor. So what he does is he actually convinces people he's God and uses tools to do this. Mm. Um, there was an article I had read um, called um, Augustus at Actium by this Jesuit priest that was written around the early 1900s. And it was weird. After the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, Augustus defeats Mark Antony to you know, become the new guy in power. And he goes to the tomb of, Aug of uh, Alexander the Great and prays before it. There's also this thing that it might have knocked the nose off of it. We don't know that. Yeah. And it was just strange. I'm like, why is this guy that would believe in pagan gods and whatever kneeling in front of this, this other man? It just seemed really weird to me. So I did a lot of research, and I just realized that Augustus was a very intelligent propagandist. So the number one thing he started with is coinage, because coins are something people use every day. So if they see your face on a coin and they see, let's say, Rome's founder Romulus on the other side, well, they know you're very powerful, yeah. right? So coinage is one thing. Another thing is... There were statues of him all over the empire, but he was never older than about 30 years old, right? Because if you're going to be, um, you know, divine in some way, you're never going to age, right? Like, yeah. though, you know, by 30, he had lost all his hair, most of his teeth, and wasn't doing so hot. But these statues made him look younger, right? Um, another thing as well is, in Rome, it wasn't very normal to, early on, this changes in the later empire, to connect yourself to gods. That was more of like an Eastern and Greek practice, and that's what we get through Alexander and his conquest of Babylon. Um, he starts connecting himself to divine people. And one of the things he does after his, his death, um, which I think you'll find this interesting, Vinny, um, is I put up a post the other day about when you look at what's happening with George Floyd. Yeah. The divine George Floyd, right? Yeah, like after his death, they're using this idea of this Thanks guy, George. no matter what his life was like, to now justify their actions. Yes. That's exactly what Caesar, did, uh, Julius Caesar Augustus did. He, he said, my father, Julius Caesar, was divine. So now because of that, that makes me divine, and it justifies my actions. Hmm. So they still use the same tools today, and I think it's really important to observe that. Shane mm -hmm. is divine, too. Yeah, yeah. this is last Very cool. With an E. I, like I, on yeah, the, I actually on the saw, side. I saw some, dude, I, I was watching, funny you bring up uh, George Floyd, I was watching videos, old videos of like, what America was going through, just like white people with the with the black fist on their so face and dumb. Being oh. and crying. And <laughs> did you see the photo of the guy wearing a face mask of just a random white guy who didn't know George Floyd crying at his casket, crying at his casket with a mask on and just like hysterical. This, like crying. hysterical. Is anyone is anyone watching? I'm yeah, a good person. Hysterical laughing, and it's like, bro, just that air with with all the black squares and and oh, I mean, in the gold casket though. Like, just just gold, think about that. Yes. Like the deified George Floyd. Now the Biden administration can use that to justify their actions, just like Augustus used that to justify ending a republic, building an empire, and creating a worship cult. It's crazy it's to me because there were like about the George Floyd and yeah, go ahead. like the the idea that this guy had statues built after him across the country, where like what do you mean where, streets and mural? I, I, mural. I the murals. How, no, Remember that time the mural I, got hit by lightning? Yeah, the mural did get hit by lightning on camera. Who did more for this country, George Floyd, George Floyd, or Vinny Oshana? Who was in the United States Air Force? Like statues why, of Vinny. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, why is it there? Why don't we have a bench with you sitting on it so yeah. young black people can come and look up to you and go, yeah. "I could be in the Air Force too." What is that symbolizing and showing the youth of America, specifically the black youth, that you prop up this guy as some type of god that, yeah. and people but it's, worship it's, him when he was a career machine. Vinny, criminal? Vinny successfully got off drugs and alcohol. That's yeah. something George Floyd and, never and, managed to do. Yeah, and let's not forget because Rob, we 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 talked about it on a podcast. I want to say a year ago where the the autopsy but for the coroner report came out and it was dude he had more drugs in him than anything else I'm pretty sure the moment the the blood pressure you know I told I, I said this too I go if if George Floyd wasn't a criminal drug using scumbag he never would have met 
Derek Chauvin. Think, think about that. If he wasn't in that gas station trying to use a counterfeit uh, on drugs, it was on uh, mad drugs, and trying to use a counterfeit bill, you never, ever would have met. You guys never would have crossed paths. And Rob said that the other day. He goes, you know how many times I've been roughed up by a cop? I'm going to ask you too, Jeremy. Never. Mm. I've never... I mean, I have been. I got, one. I got yelled at a lot when I was a kid because yeah, I, I drove. Yeah, fast of, cars, of course. But, you know. <laughs> but, but when you're doing that, your muffler is too loud. Yeah, because uh, yeah, and you're right. They edif- They made this guy into that. that it's that. important, and it's less about who he is, and it's less about what he did. Neither of those things matter. Yeah. It just matters that we have a new deity, because de- you know, a deity meaning a god, like that justifies action. So, yeah. what do you think is uh, going on? Where in Rome we were, or they were? glorifying this emperor and now we're glorifying like some dude who was drunk at a or high at a convenience store like what did rome have any kind of victim culture like that or is this some new kind of thing so i think the victim culture is new and i think the thing you have to understand about like emperors is there are really good ones and there are really bad ones you know in the, in the um late middle third century there's this one emperor who's like a child emperor named elagabalus oh yeah and he's he the, is, the transvestite the, the ones that just decided so they made that up trans. that's not real yeah. that's, that's, the, not that's real? the bbc doing woke history now the uh, thing that was weird about him is he's fake the, news he's the well, he pre- cross-dressed he's the priest of a cult uh the a cult that worshiped the black rock they were called the cult of elagabal so he has a wedding black rock? his black rock yeah. that other people attend he's pulled around by a chariot of prostitutes he um took his hairdresser and put him in charge of the grain supply and he also um, would advance men by the size of their member. So not exactly a, a transvestite, but Which definitely it's, a weird guy. It's really funny that they decide, you know, we're going to go through history and pick one Roman emperor to be a part of our weird uh, LGBT group. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that incompetent sexual degenerate seems like a pretty good one. Let's go yeah. with him. But, but is this true, though, that he did cross-dress? I just want to He did cross-dress, but I think the thing you have to consider is like, People do a lot of, not that I did, but people do a lot of weird stuff in college. And he was like 13 to 16, like somewhere in there. Yeah. So, so like, what do you expect? Emperor, so it's like college times 30,000. Yeah, no, exactly. But he has like all this money and ability <laughs> and, and he's never had to work for something What's in his up? life. So would it be possible, it seems like there is a playbook on how to bring down the civilization, right? Yes. You said earlier, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. So... If there's a playbook that exists where people can go and study what has brought down previous civilizations, is it that big of a stretch of the imagination to think that people in power today could be utilizing that playbook to bring down our society in real time? And there, there's there's two different ways I look at that. Like, I think there's always been evil people, and they seem to come back throughout time, you know, whether it's the Medicis or whether it's the Cesare Borgias or people like that throughout history. Like, they do continue to exist. Um I don't know how much of our reality is actually controlled that way. I, I, there's part of me that wants to say yes and part of me that wants to say no. Mm-hmm. But when you look historically, a central power is always trying to centralize. And why do these same terrible people always end up in power and then try to centralize their power? So I think it's, it's less of the same people doing it and more of when incompetence li- rises to a certain level, it tries to protect itself. So it's a pattern. It's a pattern rest- more, than, more than like the same people doing it, if that makes but sense. But it's a pattern that the system is built to continue to allow those people, like you said, the incompetent people Correct. that rise to the top. It's the Peter to Principle. Keep, to keep that power until the civilization crumbles. It's, it's the Peter Principle. People advance to one level above what they're actually qualified to do. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so, so, so we're on, you know, America and the future and, and what's happening. So everything that's happening right now with, with Trump and the weaponization of the Department of Justice with, and I mean, this goes back, I'm talking about Jeremy, let's go back 2016, just from that, from the Obama, uh, spying Trump, fake Russia collusion, James Comey, uh, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, Hillary getting a slap on the wrist with the, with um, with the DNC to the fi- to the impeachments to every si- to right now, which is unbelievable lawfare where you're seeing it live. Jeremy, what what are your what are your thoughts? Is anything going to change? Do you think Trump is going to win? Like, what, what's your whole what's your whole take on all that? Well, I could be totally wrong a week from now, but I think they're they're dumb enough to try and convict him and put him in jail from this. Okay, I, I think that that's really the direction they're going. Now, I, I was talking to, to Raheem Kassam about this from National Pulse not long ago. Could, could you imagine how much Trump would love to be Nelson Mandela? Big time. He would oh. love to be Nelson you, Mandela. Oh, so at the you. same time, like, if they do that, if they're dumb enough to do it, there, there's no way he loses. So I think at the same time, um, I, I just think they're, they're, they're too stupid to understand the direction they're pushing the country. Do you, you think they're too stupid, Jeremy? Or, or because I always say, like, with, with Biden, like, everybody looks at him and goes, what a— stupid sleeping mumbling creepy sniffing 
if you're a left wing person, he's doing exactly what you wanted him to do. He's yeah. going through all the mo well, the border, the you know, everything that they want. I mean, obviously this whole campus stuff is is kind of blowing up in their faces, but but I mean, if you think about it, his report card for them, he's doing everything that they wanted: stopping the drilling, stopping this, opening he's the border. The most progressive president in U.S. history, according to some accounts. I mean, his cabinet is very competent at their agenda. He is not. But also, he doesn't know where he is. I don't think yeah, exactly. I, like Connor and I have talked about this too, where he may be a belligerent, bumbling fool when it comes to just like daily interaction. But he's also, he has been in the government for an extremely long time, and he knows what he's doing, and he's fully in support of all of this. Like I think Connor said it best. He was like, um, Joe Biden's not just an incompetent guy; he's an incompetent, evil guy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, the, incompetent, there's this, corrupt guy. There's this understanding that people have, and it's an incorrect understanding that Biden is. Oh, you know, he's he's a well-meaning old guy who, like, his memory's going, and that's why he's incompetent. No, this is a guy who has schemed and plotted and enriched himself through politics off the back of the American taxpayer for his entire life. He's just old yeah, now. He has never meaningfully contributed to anything. He has yeah. he has schemed and stolen everything he could get his hand on for the benefit of his entire family as well. And well, he, he's shown uh, himself but, to be a yeah. liar throughout his career. Even, exactly. Even when his wife passed, they, they blamed it on a, a DWI, and that it sh it's been shown that might not even be true. Or you look at the, the speech in, I think it was 1988, when he was running for president. It was stolen from like a Labor Party leader in the UK. Yeah. So yeah. it's like... Yeah. But now that he's old... And all that is falling apart. Like, when he has his lucid moments, he's just back to being evil. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's not like he, he defaults back to being a nice, well-meaning guy. Yeah. He, he defaults to being selfish and conniving. Yeah, I, I don't believe... Yeah, I, uh, great point, Connor, because I do not believe that just because you can't remember the evil shit and the person that you are because you're lost in there, to hell with that. I think I'm, I am pro 100% accountability across the board. If, if All of us, we all get in trouble. If you, if you break the law, Jeremy, if Shane, Connor, all of us, we mess up, Rob, you're going to pay the piper, okay? Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. There's no dodging the raindrops. You get in trouble. I can k give two shits. This guy has been corrupt. He's been actually racist on camera, yeah. on audio, multiple times. How we treated uh, Clarence Thomas. Oh, one the of the hearing. most disgusting yeah. things. I, I, it's funny you say that. I watched mm -hmm. that two days ago and just the taking a, a, a black man just because you don't want you don't want him taking that seat and just bringing that girl and doing all that shit yeah. that was one of the the most disgusting moments and i love how clarence thomas was like this is complete yeah. horse shit what you guys tech lynching so yeah. jeremy who are uh, in your mind like who are the top five worst roman em emperors and is biden as bad as them um or maybe just one. Who's the worst? So the worst, Elagabalus is pretty bad. Okay. Commodus is terrible because Commodus, okay. uh, the son of Marcus Aurelius, um, wants to be a gladiator more than he wants to be an emperor. But he's kind of a kind of a wimp. That was from the from the movie uh, from Gladiator, which um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix played it perfect. He was trying to bang the sister because he wanted the bloodline, right? right? Yeah. Was that was that factual? That I that I don't. That we don't know. They, they, but they, they, I mean, some they made there. up pretty much everything because that's not not how Marcus Aurelius died. Yeah. yeah. But. Still a great movie, and he well he Marcus Aurelius. It's funny because he gets so much credit throughout history as being like you know this stoic and this you know you know really great philosopher. Yeah. But he actually breaks what's called the five good emperors. Before that, they wouldn't name their son or their descendant. They they basically adopt the next closest qualified person and say you're going to be emperor. Oh, wow. So it starts with Nerva in I think it's like 96 or 98, and it goes through Aurelius in 180. But then Aurelius is like, I got this really dumb spoiled kid. His name's Commodus, and he's your new emperor. And his actions, he dies in 192, and in 192, it's what's called the year of the five emperors, because it's just turnover, 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 it creates this power vacuum. And if you had to look at the reason, it takes a long time, but even Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, talks about this. Commodus is the guy that actually starts the decline of Rome in 192. So if you want to look at that, Commodus is bad, Elagabalus is pretty bad, and you know there's definitely others. And I'm, well, like, and thank you, Jeremy, because now for our, for our viewers, so I bet you guys had no idea you were about to get schooled <laughs> on Rome, on Rome.